Today I'm going to review my Canon EOS A2E. Everything I say in this review should essentially apply to the Canon EOS A2 and EOS 5, which are essentially the same camera, um, but I'll go over the differences between all three variations later on. The Canon EOS A2E, A2, and EOS 5 were released in 1992. That was about five years after the start of the EOS film camera lineup and about three years after the flagship EOS 1 was released. Currently you can find these on the used market for as low as $25-$30 um, on up to a couple hundred dollars which I think is overpriced. The, the, the price range that I would stick with would be between $25 to, to all the way up to $100 depending on the condition and what's included. Right off the bat, I can tell you that I really like this camera, and this is actually the second time I've owned this. I've owned the uh, A2 that didn't have the eye control, um, but they're essentially the same camera, and I love this camera. Really, regardless of what price you buy this camera at, it is totally capable of being your only film camera. Before I get into the pros and cons of this camera, let's just take a quick overview of the design. If you've used or have looked or held any other EOS camera from the Canon lineup, Fillmore and Digital, you're going to notice a lot of similarities between those and this camera. From the grip to the button layouts to the LED screen on top, this was the early days of the EOS film camera lineup, but you could see the similar design language that is carried through till today. And speaking of design, let's go right into the pros of this camera because the design and feel of the camera is one of the positives that I like. So first off, the build quality is superb. It's a decent mix of metal and plastic, but with a really, really solid metal core. And really just in general, every little button, switch, and dial feels responsive. And considering this is almost a 30 year old camera, that's pretty impressive. It has one of the deeper grips that I've seen on a uh, EOS film camera. It's deeper than the one on my EOS 1 and I'm pretty sure it's as deeper deeper as the one on my uh, EOS 6D, my digital camera. I like decent sized grips. A deep grip isn't a make or break item for me but it's nice to have. Another thing that goes along with the design but it's also a feature that I use is the command dial on the back. I've talked about this before but this is a, uh, a feature that's a staple of US film and DSLRs. The way they would work by default is the command dial on the back would control your aperture and the little wheel or dial on the top between the shutter release button and the LED screen would control your shutter speed. So with one hand you could operate the shutter speed and aperture. Other manufacturers have their own way of doing it. Nikon is, is, a, is this smaller dial up top um, so you could still do one hand operation but I've gotten really used to the command dial, the command wheel and uh, having this have it on here is really nice. One feature that's unique to Canon or was unique to Canon um, at the time was the eye controlled autofocus points. That's what the E stood for on this camera. What that meant was that when you had the camera up to your eye, instead of moving the dial to select the autofocus point that you wanted, you could just look at the autofocus point with your eye and it would it would know that's the one you wanted. It's a pretty cool feature, um, although I will admit I haven't got to the point where I'm using it on a regular basis. Um, but I could see I could see a situations where if you had it dialed in, it could be something to, that you could get used to. It's interesting though that they that they stopped that feature when they went to DSLRs. The eye control autofocus is uh, a cool feature, um, but it's not something that I look for. Um, I put it on the pros list because it's it's an added bonus. It's not taking away from anything else. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. Um, but there is one extra thing that the eye control sensor or the eye sensor gives you on this camera that is is nice it, it accommodates for something else that it's missing which I'll cover in the, in the in the cons list okay so the next thing on the pros list is the 
metering options. The most important one for me that I, I'm grateful that this one has is spot metering. Um, it spots down to, I think, a 3.5% area, which is pretty decent small point. It's not as small as they come. I think the EOS 1N and EOS 3 and the EOS 1V are smaller, but 3.5 is definitely smaller than 9%, which is what most partial metering measurements were for the other EOS cameras below this one. As I've said many times, spot metering is my favorite way to meter for what I shoot, street photography, landscapes, and things like that. Another positive that I haven't used, and I'm not sure exactly when I will use it, but it has a built-in flash, which is nice. And again, it's one of those features that you don't need to use. Uh, I, I, I barely use mine at all, but having it on there is nice. And I think it's a positive of this camera and definitely not a negative. I talk about shutter speeds all the time with film cameras I review. Um, when cameras only go up to one two thousandth or one four thousandth of a second, sometimes I'll put those in the cons list because uh, depending on what you're shooting, sometimes you want that faster shutter speed. With this camera, you get it. You get all the way up to one eight thousandth of a second. So if that's something if, if that's something you're used to on the cameras you have now digitally, then this is going to be a, uh, a nice feature for you to get. One of my favorite things about the EOS film camera lineup, um, specifically the prosumer or professional versions of these cameras, is the customization. So whether that's the EOS 1, 1N, 1V, US 3 or this camera, you can customize a handful of things on the camera to work how you want it to work. You can customize things like having a little bit of film left over when, when it rewinds back into the canister so you can easily pull it out for development, or whether that means um, putting the autofocus button to one of the buttons on the back, which is what I always do, turning on enabling rear button autofocus. Um, and on this camera, that, that button would be this one that says the CF button on the back. I always transfer the out of focus from being on the shutter release button to the back button so I can separate those two, two operations. Having that option to customize things like that is a huge benefit of that. Um, I don't dive too deep into much more of the customization options, but if customizing a camera is something that you like to do, this camera would be something I would look at. This has 16 customizable functions and a couple of them that I do all the time, including the back button autofocus. Another custom function on this camera that I've enabled kind of combos with one of the cons of this camera. Um, I always prefer to have a depth of field button physically on the camera. This one does not, but there's an option to do a depth of field preview some other way. On this camera, you have two options. You can you can turn on a depth of field preview option with one of the back buttons, or you can turn on eye control and preview depth of field by looking in the top left-hand corner of the viewfinder. And there's a small indicator that looks like an autofocus point almost, but slightly different. And if you look at that, then it, it, clo it, it, it closes the aperture and gives you a depth of field preview. I just recently started playing around with that, but having that option is pretty cool. So yeah, it's, it's a bummer there's no dedicated button, but Canon does give you alternatives. Before I get into the cons list, keep in mind that I just don't want you to think that all these cameras are perfect all the time, but it does seem like I'm ha I have a hard time finding legitimate negatives about these cameras. So oftentimes I'll call these negatives or cons, but really they're just in comparison to something else. Um, for example, the depth of field preview button that I just talked about, that's not a deal breaker. It's not, it's not something that's gonna stop you from working. The cons list for this camera is another example of stuff I might be reaching for, but if I'm comparing it to the EOS 1, to US 3, these are a couple of things that I'm, you're gonna know that's, that, that's different. And, and if you have the choice between those and this one, then you'll be able to make a more of informed decision on which one to choose. So first off, actually, I'm gonna compare this to the EOS 5, which is essentially the same camera, but the European version of this camera. Um, one thing that the EOS 5 has that this does not have is the 
exposure scale in the viewfinder. For me personally, this is the biggest negative of this camera. I wish I had the EOS 5. Um, eventually, I might get it. But um, if you have the EOS 5, then this doesn't apply to you. You have the exposure scale. On this camera, for some reason, they didn't include the exposure scale when you're in manual mode. If you're in aperture priority, if you're in some other mode, you'll see a exposure scale in the viewfinder. So if you're doing um, bracketing or anything like that, you'll you'll get that information. But when you're in manual mode, all you have is a plus and minus indicator, what letting you know whether you're underexposed or overexposed. And when you lock on exposure, then the plus and minus light up together. So it's really easy to 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 work with that though. Um, other many other cameras have a similar system. I think even the Nikon F3 has a plus or minus type exposure system. But I've gotten really used to working with the exposure scale. So I wish this one had it. The, the 2 and the 2E, A2, the A2 and the A2E do not. Um, so for me, that's the biggest negative when comparing it to other things, even comparing it to <laughs> essentially its own European version. Another negative is relative to other professional models from Canon. On the US 1, 1N, US 3, and 1V, the LED panel up top illuminates. So if you're in a dark shooting situation, it becomes super easy to be able to see your settings without having to pull out a flashlight or, or, or do anything, or just, you know, straining your eyes to see. Um, this doesn't have that. It's by no means a deal breaker. But again, building a list of pros and cons, I have to compare some specific things that this doesn't have that those other cameras do and that that LED illumination would be something that's nice to have but definitely not a deal, deal breaker. I already talked about the lack of the depth of field button which is not a big deal especially since they give you an alternative. Really that's it for the negatives. Um, as you can see it's the, wasn't a long list and I'm kind of reaching on them in a way but uh, my whole purpose for doing these videos is if you're starting from zero or if you're adding to your film camera collection and you have some money to spend, there's no reason why you shouldn't make an informed decision and in knowing the differences between these US film cameras, especially since they all land in a similar price range. I mean, starting at the Rebel G, which I call the $15 film camera because it's like an amazing film camera packed in a $15 package. If you start at that Rebel G or Rebel Kiss or whatever one you get and you go all the way up to um, an EOS 1N or even maybe sometimes even an EOS 3 but even if you just stop at the EOS 1N everything all the Canon EOS film cameras are packed between that $15 and $150 let's say so you have a lot of choices in that price range so the difference comes down to oftentimes is what you can find what you have access to and the specific features that you might need so there's no other way to, to truly make an informed decision than to know those minute, minute details. And that's what I'm hoping to expose here and hoping to talk about. Um, I've owned a handful of these now, so I can kind of pick and choose and be, be really picky about some of these cameras. But the reality is with this camera, like some of the other EOS film cameras, if all I had was the EOS A2E or A2 or EOS 5 and a good lens like the Nifty 50, this would be the only camera that I would need. Um, it has all the features included that I that I, that I look for in a film camera. It's compatible with the lenses that I want to use. Um, it's a completely, completely capable camera. If you find one within a decent price range that's working, I see no reason why you shouldn't pick it up, especially if you don't have a film camera yet. This camera seems to be fairly easy to find, although the price varies greatly between that $25 to $100 $115 range. But accessibility makes this camera a really, really good option. There's a lot of small details of this camera um, that I could go over that would take could take me a while. So if you want to see like a manual sort of video or some a walkthrough, let me know in the comments. I could do something like that. If you search on YouTube for this camera, there's been a lot of great reviews 
done on this one already. And as other people have mentioned, which I think is super cool and worth mentioning too, is that um, this camera was the camera that the production team for The Matrix used in order to capture the frames they needed for the bullet time effect. Um, if you search up the behind the scenes of the, the making of The Matrix, you'll see that setup where they have multiple A2, Canon A2 cameras set up in sequence in a circle and they're all connected and going off in perfect timing to capture that, that, that effect that they made. That's just a really, really cool trivia question <laughs> regarding this camera. Okay, I feel like I can go on and on about this camera, but I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. But again, let me know if you wanted me to dive in deeper. I can make it some more dedicated videos and walkthroughs about these cameras. Um, and if you watch this video and you think I got something wrong or I have a different view on something, please add it in the comments. And I won't re-edit and upload these videos, but I'll try to amend things in comments like I've done on some of the other videos. People have pointed out things that I missed or just totally forgot when I was recording the video. But I hope you're liking the series of EOS film camera videos so far. If you have a suggestion of one that I haven't recorded yet, please comment below. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe and keep an eye on the channel for more photography videos as well as some other filmmaking and writing related things.